uh, we'll get going on this lecture, which is on uh, stress concentrations. All right, so what is a stress concentration? Well, up to this point, uh, we've been paying attention to resultant loading, so internal resultant forces and, uh, and moments, uh, and average stresses. Uh, but as we can see in this you know, potato image over here that we started with back on the first lecture, um, in most situations, we can talk about a resultant loading here and an average stress, but some parts of the section phase are going to be experiencing different stresses than other parts of the section phase. Um, and so, in other words, the local stresses, the stress at this point and at that point and here at that point, are all going to be different than the average stress. Uh, and for each of those parts, those elements there that have a local stress, we can define a stress in much the same way we did with resultant forces and, res and stresses. We can talk about a, a normal uh, force or stress. We can talk about a shear force or stress. We can talk about a bending moment. We can talk about a torsional moment. Uh, at each of those different local stresses. And so what we're going to do over the next couple lectures is talk about ways to determine that distrib distribution of loading. Uh, and for us, that the big deal there is to ultimately to find uh, a way to quantify maximum stresses, not only to quantify them, but to be able to say where they are uh, in a particular element or a particular member. Right, so when is a local stress significant? Uh, it's significant when uh, that local stress differs significantly um, from our average stress, and particularly when it's higher uh, than that average stress. And one of those situations that this happens is what's called a stress concentration. So imagine a, a, a beam like this with a tensile load, and if, when we solve this, Earlier, we just took that load and said, okay, my internal resultant force is equal to N. I found my cross-sectional area, and I said my average stress is N over A. Okay, but here we get a situation in which this hole that's been drilled in our beam changes the way the stress works uh, within the beam here. Uh, and rather than having an average stress where the every part of the beam is basically resisting uh, about the same amount, we get a stress concentration. This part of the beam right next to the hole ends up uh, 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 withstanding a, a significant part of that load, uh, and that means that its local stress, the local maximum stress, is going to be higher. So right along in here next to the hole, I'm going to have really large stresses. And let's say here my average stress might be somewhere along in here. Uh, that maximum stress is going to be higher than that average stress. So if I depended just on average stress, I'd underestimate how much stress uh, this member was um, under, undergoing. Now this makes uh, for important design implications because it means we have to consider that maximum stress. If we have a maximum stress right here that's higher than the failure stress of this material. We might see a crack that starts to develop here. And once that crack starts to develop here, that can really lead to the failure of the whole piece. So a, a failure at a local failure uh, can oftentimes lead to a total failure. And obviously we don't want to do that. So that's why we want to find uh, a maximum stress here rather than just an average stress. Now, in order to figure out a, the, a stress concentration, find that maximum stress, uh, we need to use two values. Uh, one of those is a, a maximum average normal stress. That sounds sort of, <laughs> it's too many words there, right? But really, this is just the average normal stress in which we say, okay, we want to know in the whole beam, where's the largest average, right? And so if I have that you know, a force pulling this way and that way on this beam here. I'm going to have an average normal stress here. Even if I ignore stress concentrations, I'm going to have an average uh, normal stress here that's bigger than here because it's going to be N over A, uh, and my A here is small. So we want to find the average normal stress 
at the place in the member where that's going to be largest. So here, we'd want to find it here, okay, because my cross-sectional area is smaller at section A than it is over here, okay? So when we calculate in the, for purposes of uh, stress concentrations, so when we calculate a uh, uh, average normal stress, we want to find it at the place where that's going to be the largest value. Once we do that, we also want to figure out what our maximum stress is, right? Sigma max. Um, and like I said before, we can do that in a number of different ways if we have the time, um, computational or experimental techniques. Uh, but oftentimes we want to do that more quickly. Uh, and so what uh, we do is we have somebody else do our experiments, which is essentially what this plot here is. It's going to tell us uh, what kind of stress concentration we get in a particular kind of geometry uh, with particular values. Uh, and we use a stress concentration factor, K. And this is sigma max over sigma average. Sigma average, we figured out on the previous slide, right? We're going to find that normal stress at the highest place, which is going to be, in this case, right here, right? Um, and then we're going to find out K from our plot, uh, and that will allow us to solve for sigma max. Uh, so in other words, K is a way for us to take an easy calculation and turn it into a more uh, difficult to find quantity. So if we look here on this plot, you can see a bunch of lines, right? You know, it can be a little... Uh, overwhelming is this guy's uh, noting here um, but we're gonna decide look you know we look at our geometry up here the width of our wide part the width of our um, uh, smaller cross-sectional area we've got our thickness here we've got our radius of curvature there all of this stuff matters here um, and so we're going to, let's say, if I find W and H for a particular piece I have, then I'm going to look at this line, right? And then I'm going to find R over H. And let's say my R over H is 0.4. I'm going to go up to 0.4 on that 3.0 line. And then I'm going to go over here to find K, and K will be about 1.5, okay? So we use the geometric values on this chart to convert our geometry into a given K. And that allows us uh, then to solve for sigma max. That's called a stress concentration factor. So these K plots, these stress concentration factor plots, like this one over here, are useful when we want to think about design, right? Because we want to decide um, how to design a piece that is going to concentrate stress as little as possible, right, given the parameters of our piece, right? So, you know, in a general situation, something like W might be defined by something else, right? We might want to keep W the same. And the same with H. H might be, you know, we don't want to make it any bigger uh, for some reason that happens, you know, the way this piece functions. Right, so WH might be, say, defined by outside circumstances, so we pick this line. And then R is something that we might have a little more control over, right? How much do we want to uh, essentially spend on this piece in order to make it uh, not concentrate the stresses, right? Because this is going to be easy to manufacture, uh, but it's going to have large stress concentrations here, okay? And if those are going to cause that piece to fail, we need to do something about that. So then ideally, we might smooth that out as much as possible, right, in order to reduce uh, those stress concentrations. Uh, and by increasing R, uh, we can lower the value of K, right? If I make R bigger, uh, I'm moving over to the right-hand side here, and my K values generally are pretty small. So this would be great. Uh, but we also might add other features here uh, to achieve the same effect without add, adding a lot of um, uh, manufacturing costs. This piece, uh, particularly on a larger beam, that would be really difficult to make and um, 
especially the more we smooth that out, uh, the more difficult that is to manufacture. Uh, and so you might go with a smaller radius of curvature here, but then add, you know, some pieces, uh, some cutouts here, or even holes drilled in a piece uh, that would make this less rigid. Um, and the less, more that that, you know, the less rigid that is, the less we're going to have a stress concentration right there. So we have some design options, but this K plot gives us some sense of how to pursue those options. What would, what would give us the best results uh, in a way that's uh, relatively easy to manufacture. So let's do a couple of uh, questions. So we have, we're gonna design a piece here um, and it's a beam with a hole drilled in it. And so we give you the values here uh, and we have uh, a tensile force of 2000 Newtons. So what is the average, maximum average stress for this member? Give you a minute to figure that out. Remember, you have to find the smallest cross-sectional area to find that maximum average stress. So go ahead and pause. And we're back. Then you want to find the K value for this member. So that means, in this case, we only have one line, so it's a little bit easier here. All you have to do is find your value here and then find out where that crosses this line, right? So if 2RW over W is 0.2, we go up here to find the line, and that tells us our K value is 2.45. So pause here. Now we want to find what's the maximum local stress for the member. So to solve this, you're going to use that K equation. Right, K is equal to sigma max over sigma average. Um, we know what K is and what sigma average is. So now find sigma max. And I'll pause again. And then uh, we'll get a, a little trickier here. So this plot is a little counterintuitive, right? If I make R smaller, I'm going to move to the left on this plot. Um, and that means I'm actually going to see my K value go up. Okay. We would think if we made R smaller, we'd be making this hole smaller, right? Um, and we'd end up with smaller uh, maximum stresses, right? So what happens here? Why is that? Why does that make sense? Uh, so try to explain that um, and think about what else changes when you get a smaller R. Okay, so if we wanted to solve for maximum stress, um, what else would we need to solve for other than K? And write a couple sentences to explain that. And that is it for today's lecture.